Good morning, everybody. It's good to be with you. I'm waiting here as everybody shows up. I'm seeing Jerry there, Steve. Good to be with you, everybody, this morning as we gather. <clears throat> Once you get your video launched, um, Feel free to grab some coffee or your Bibles or a notebook. Uh, we won't start until the top of the hour. So you can just kind of leave this running until we start. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. It's joining. For those of you that just hopped on, we'll, we'll start at nine o'clock. Um, if you're new um, to the webinar class, uh, you might want to orient yourself to Zoom because we can talk and ask questions. Um, there is a feature where you can raise your hand virtually and I can unmute you and then you can ask your question or you can uh, make your comment. So um, if you don't know how to do that yet, you might want to I think it's down in the participants button. I think that's right. Um, and then the other button you can use if you do not want to talk verbally, but ask a question or make a comment, you can use the chat button. And you can also talk to each other in the chat window, uh, I think as well. So um, use the chat button or raise your hand as we go, as we go forward. Good to see everybody showing up to class today. Good morning, everybody. As I was just telling everybody that was hopping on the chat, uh, hopping on the webinar, if you don't know how to use it yet or you didn't learn how to use it last week, there's a raise your hand function down in the participants bar uh, if you're using a laptop. Um, that I can unmute you. And you can also use the chat window to ask questions as well. So. Those are the things you can use. I'm waiting on my wife to hop on here because she's going to be my my moderator. Good morning, everybody that's hopping on. Seeing lots of people joining now. I can't keep up with all everybody hopping on. So if you're new, again, I've been saying this as people hop on. If you're new to the webinar format, there are ways we can interact in this live class format. Um, if you look down in your participants button at the bottom of your screen, at least it's in the bottom of my screen, you can raise your hand. Um, uh, when you raise your hand, we're going to take that as a sign that uh, Jana, I'm unmuting you. Okay. As best you should. Yeah, I need. <laughs> um, so it, you're so funny. All right. Do you want? Do you want to? Can you unmute and? unmute yourself or do do you have that ability or do i have that ability can i yeah 
I think I can. Yes, I can. Okay, you can mute and unmute yourself. Okay. Um, okay, I'll let you handle that as we go. So it's a, it's nine o'clock, and so um, people are still hopping in. So I'm just going to wait a little bit as people continue to join us. It's good to see everybody here. So um, we're going to go ahead and start. So, hey, welcome everybody. Um, just saying hi to you, honey. I'll take my video off, but good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, so it's 9.01. So uh, everybody listening in, uh, my name is Richard Beck, and I'm going to be leading us for um, uh, this week and three more weeks. And we're going to be going through this book, um, Reading Romans Backwards by Scott McKnight. Now, if you were here last week, you know some of this stuff, but if you have just joined us uh, today, let me just give you some orientation on how this, um, how this works. So the first thing you should know is that we're recording this. So if you speak um, or ask a question out loud for the class, you're gonna be recorded. So I just want you to know that so you feel informed. Um, the other ways uh, that you can interact with us is through the chat. So two things. If you raise your hand, and if you're new to Zoom, um, down in the, the toolbar in participants, there is an, a way you can raise your hand. And, and when Jana sees you raise your hand, she's going to interrupt, uh, and we will unmute you, and then you can ask your question or make your comment or question out loud. Okay, so anytime you feel like you want to talk, share, you got a point, you got a question, um, you got a disagreement, raise your hand. Okay, and then I will unmute you and then you'll talk verbally. Just know you're being recorded. If you do not want to talk verbally, um, but want to ask a question or make a comment, down at the bottom of the toolbar is a chat window. And you can type in your questions or your comments down there. Jana will be watching the chat window as well and she will break in with questions as they come in, okay? So feel free to um, use the chat and also raise your hand at any point if you want to make this more um, or less interactive. So to begin with some group discussion, um, anybody from last week I want to share kind of what rolled around in your head last week. Um, raise your hand if you have something that last week's discussion kind of prompted in your mind. I'm just curious about that. I've been thinking about last week myself. So if, you, if there was something, so Larry raised his hand. I'm, Larry, I'm gonna let you just, Larry, can you uh, talk now? I think so, uh, yeah, can you hear so me? Yeah, yeah. So, Larry, what what did last week's class roll around in your head? What have you been thinking about? Richard, your comment about Paul making decisions Christologically has been a potential game changer for me. You said he did not, he could have turned to scripture, but he didn't. And he made decisions Christologically. And I thought that was a huge point. Thank you. Yeah, you know, I, I, you know, I said that out loud, Larry, but I don't even know if I know the implications of that. You know, it's such a big idea that I've been really wrestling this whole week about what that looks like as well, you know, like, because like, uh, um, it's easy to say that, sentence, but it's also harder to think about the implications once that starts rolling out. I mean, is that your take of it all? I think it's just a huge concept. Yes, I... I actually discussed this briefly with Steve Hare the other day we were riding bikes and uh, tried to make some application or figure out the far reaching implications of this principle. But uh, yeah, I, I went online wanting to buy your book, I mean, buy the, the Scott McKnight's book that I couldn't get it before this week's discussion, but you know, I just really appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, great. Anybody else want to, thanks, Larry. I appreciate that. Um, anybody else want to raise a hand? Something that 
that uh, last week struck you or you're uh, been thinking about before we launch into things? I just want to let you guys talk as much as you want um, before I launch into some material. Anybody else? Okay. All right. Well, um, let's, let's, uh, some people weren't with us last week, so let's kind of start with some uh, review. And I want to try to do this fairly quickly and then maybe go a little deeper uh, this week. So if you, um, uh, hey, I'm just going to give Jana a note. Hey, Jana, when people raise their hand, could you go ahead and unlower their hand? Do you have that uh -huh. ability? I'm trying to figure out how to do that. Okay. All right. Um, I'm, what I'm doing is I'm literally keeping a list who has already spoken, whose hand is up, so that I can kind of keep track of that because I can't figure out how to lower it. But they okay. themselves can lower it. Okay, great. Okay. Like All Larry right. just lowered his own hand because he's a big boy. There we go. <laughs> okay. All right. So for those of you guys that just tuned in, quick quick recap. So what does it mean to read Romans um, backwards? Um, so what we reviewed last week was typically Romans is in three big chunks. Uh, there's chapter one through eight, where is the theological meat of the book is. And we traditionally read that uh, big theological theme as that we're saved by uh, grace through faith and, and not by works. And so it's Paul's great discourse on faith. It's faith in Jesus Christ that justifies us, makes us righteous. And Abraham is a model, right? Abraham believes and it's reckoned to him as righteousness. Then after the first eight chapters, nine, 10, and 11, Paul does this detour into the situation of um, unbelieving Israel. And the question is there, what, what is God's um, gonna do? What is God gonna do with unbelieving Israel? And so Paul kind of just talks about their status in God's covenantal promises. And then after that big theological discourse, beginning in chapter 12, which is where we'll be today, um, through 16, Paul turns to very practical matters. That's reading Romans forwards. And we mentioned that when you read Romans forwards, some puzzles emerge. First of all, after Paul kind of does the big theological discourse in chapters 1 through 8, this detour into the issue of Israel seems... Uh, kind of like a, a sideshow that doesn't seem to have a lot of connection back with what Paul earlier was talking about. And there's also a bit of a switcheroo when we read Romans forward in this traditional way, where um, Paul seems to be saying, you're saved by faith and not by works. And then you get to chapter 12 and he says, and so therefore offer your bodies as living sacrifices. And then he talks about all of these things we need to be doing. And so Paul, Paul seems to think works is very, much a part of this process. And so we, we, we end up back with that dichotomy between faith and works. So, so that's reading Romans forward and some of the puzzles it presents. Reading Romans backwards begins at the end, Scott McKnight suggests. When we read Romans backwards, we begin with chapters 12 through 16 with the pastoral con context. Paul is dealing with a pastoral situation in Rome. Um, and that is, that's where he has his eye the entire time. And so therefore, when you read Romans backwards, then you realize that the first eight chapters, one through, uh, one through eight, and even chapters nine, 10, and 11, the seeming detour into the, to the situation with unbelieving Israel actually really isn't a detail. All of that material, one through 11, is actually aiming towards this pastoral context. So if we know where Paul's going pastorally, then a lot of the material that leads up to that seems to make a lot more sense and also a lot more practical. So last week we asked the question, what was that pastoral context? The pastoral context seems to be that in the early days of Roman Christianity, the Jews were the first wave of context, the, the first wave of converts. So <clears throat> the Jews were kind of the first Jesus followers in Rome. However, they are expelled by the emperor Claudius and Gentiles begin to take leadership in the church. They begin establishing their house churches. Many of these Gentiles are wealthy patrons of the church. So they have the houses, the villas where the church can gather. Um, and so they begin establish, establishing a kind of a uniquely Jewish, not Jewish, a uniquely Gentile um, flavored Christianity. And the emperor Nero 
allows the Jews to return and amongst them the Jewish Christians. And so this seems to be the collision, the social collision that is taking place in the book of Romans, where you have the Gentile leaders kind of establishing their kind of Gentile flavored faith. And the Jewish Christians are returning back to Rome and they're trying to be reincorporated back into that church uh, family. And that is creating some tensions that we see emerging in the last part of the book. And Scott McKnight says that this conflict is characterized by a couple different things. One is judgmentalism, that the Jewish Christians, when they return, they kind of see the Gentile Christians doing things that violate Jewish customs and norms um, and Torah, ob uh, observing the Torah. And so they, they come in and they're kind of offering this religious judgment of the Gentiles. The Gentiles, for their part, are looking down upon, Paul uses the word despising, they're looking down on uh, the Jewish Christians who are returning. And so Scott McKnight uses a very powerful and evocative phrase that we talked about last week, that this is a church life that is characterized by the verbal crucifixion of the other, the verbal crucifixion of the other. Paul, Scott McKnight goes on to say that the issues at Rome were issues of privilege and power. So the privilege goes both ways, we observe. The Jewish Christians have privilege because they have history with God. They are the ones that receive the promises. So there is a kind of religious heritage there that they have, and they can use that privilege to judge these Gentiles who don't know anything about you know, the Old Testament or the covenant made to Abraham or the messianic promises to David. This is not their story. They are coming um, to this second hand. And so the Jews can have this kind of privilege. The privilege though on the Gentile side is more socioeconomic. Their privilege is that they have status. They are citizens of Rome. They also have wealth. And, and they are also the ones that are controlling these churches. So they have social status and, and privilege. When it comes to power, that seems to be a bit more asymmetrical. The power seems to reside with the Gentile patrons of the church. They're the ones that are now controlling things. They have legal status. They have the houses where the churches meet. They have the money. And so consequently, they have power where the Jewish brothers and sisters coming in um, are in a disempowered situation. And so we talked about how when Paul talks about the strong versus the weak um, in the book, that these are um, groups that, that differ across a couple different things. The strong and the weak represent a ethnic difference. So there's an ethnic division in the church, Gentile and Jewish. And that seems very relevant to our day. There's also a difference of conscience People's consciences are being violated by the way they eat food that has been sacrificed to idols or is unclean. So the Jewish members have this conscience issue. So this can be an issue of ethnicity, can also be a, a, a conflict of conscience. But lastly, it is also a, a tension of power, powerless people versus those who have power. And so the conflicts are, are falling across all these different kinds of lines, power lines, ethnic lines, and also conscience lines. And Richard, uh, Patty has a, had a comment at the beginning in a chat that I think speaks to what you're saying there from, from the top of the class, if you want to look at that. Okay, so Patty writes, Patty, thank you for that. Um, along the same lines, your quote that Paul does not lay down a law to make everyone agree on everything, but instead a Christ-like posture is where... Um, he guides us. And yeah, Patty, I think that's exactly right. Um, and so let me, let me sit there for a little bit. So Tim raised the question last week, Tim Sensing did, about when we read these conflicts between the weak and the strong, and Paul asked the strong to yield to the weak, um, that in the churches of Christ, at least, for those of you guys listening as a Church of Christ with some Church of Christ history, worry a little bit about that because as Tim said, this it seems like sometimes the squeakiest wheel always gets the grease. So it seems to say that anybody who has an issue of conscience can raise that issue of conscience 
And therefore everybody then has to yield to that person. And so that person can kind of become a little kind of, uh, they can use their conscience, their, their moral quibbles as a way to kind of get the group to do what they want. And um, I didn't, I don't think I had a great answer for Tim last week. And I've been thinking about that. And I want to kind of wade into some murky waters here. So I apologize for this. Um, but I want to kind of talk about the gender discernment thing again, because I think a lot of us are probably thinking about that. Like, how is this strong and weak going to play out in our gender discernment issue? And so one way you can think about it is like, if somebody feels that um, it is a matter of conscience that I, that I don't feel like uh, women should be included as elders. That's a matter of my conscience. So does that mean everybody that's for inclusion must yield to that person's conscience? Okay. Um, but on the other side, you can have somebody say, it's a matter of conscience for me that I think women should be included. That it is a matter of justice, a matter of equality. And so therefore to not have women included is a matter of conscience for me. And so that gets rarely murky because everybody's now approaching this issue. And I think that's one of the tensions that we're struggling with is that everybody's coming at this from a matter of conscience. And it's very hard to tell, well, who's the strong and the weak in these matters of conscience here, okay? But I wanna speak broad, more broadly from conscience. Let's talk about power. Because uh, that seems to be an issue here in Romans. So you might say that um, the people that have the power in the gender discernment situation are, those, are the men. And so the men should yield their power and, and allow others to have access to that. So maybe it's not a issue of conscience, maybe it's an issue of power, which males have, and disempowerment, which females have less of. Maybe that's the issue. Lastly, maybe, this, maybe there might be, this might be a more of a missionary issue. Paul thinks over and over again as a missionary. And Paul might, what, what if Paul says, you know, Church, you guys have had a way of doing things, a very traditional way of doing things, but the culture has changed so much that now there's this conflict between the church and the culture that now newer members, okay, so you think of our young people, our newer members are stumbling, right? Our, our young people are stumbling at the traditional teachings of the church on gender roles, and because they're stumbling, Maybe we should yield from a missionary perspective so the gospel gets a hearing amongst these younger believers so we're not forcing them to walk away from the church. Now, I'm not saying all of that to, to put my thumb down on the gender discernment. I'm just saying it seems to me that when we approach these issues, it's very murky where the lines of power and privilege and conscience are to be located. That's all I'm trying to say. It is very murky about, is this male, female, an issue of conscience here, an issue of conscience there? Is this a traditional teaching that needs to make a missionary accommodation for younger people who are stumbling and falling away? They're not hearing the gospel. What, like, who, who, who is to yield? Which brings me to the point that we made last week and that Larry and Patty both raised. What seems very clear in Romans is that Paul doesn't, come through and say, here is, here is the teaching on food or, or whatever that everybody has to subscribe to. He keeps pushing the Romans, and I think you keep pushing us into this cruciform posture. So for those of you who weren't here last week, the, the, the quote that I used that, that Larry was referring to is that Paul doesn't solve their problems biblically. He doesn't come down and say, here's the teaching. He tries to solve their problems Christologically, which is just a fancy word for saying that we adopt the posture of Jesus. Jesus becomes our example. And when we adopt that posture of Jesus, that's how we are going to resolve these issues. So when I think about the gender role discernment, I think as murky as it is and complicated as it is, what I'm asking us to think about here this morning is what, what, what does a Christ, how, how should I yield? We're all over the map on this. How, how should we yield? What would it look like from whatever power and privilege that I have to yield? 
And what if everybody was doing that? What, what new reality could emerge out of that? So um, I just want to kind of float that out there. That's kind of where I was thinking this week. Like, who are the strong and the weak in the gender discernment? And I just found that all over the map. I just couldn't locate clearly who is what. I, I can see it different ways. And it just kind of led me to the conclusion that what if everybody in that, in that network took on the form of Christ? And I think that's what Paul is pointing towards. Before you move on, Richard, Terry yeah. Fulton made a comment um, about Paul speaking pastorally to increase the cause of Christ, if you want to glance at that. Uh, is this is Terry's comment. Yeah, so Paul, Terry writes, Paul also wrote this pastorally because he was afraid of church division uh, and the integrity of the gospel message. And that's something else we talked about last week. I think Paul's big fear is that the, the church would split. That the, that the Gentile churches would not be able to incorporate the Jewish members and that those two would divide. And then you'd have this kind of Jewish sect in Rome, a Jewish Christian sect, and then a kind of a Gentile Christianity. And, and for Paul, the unity of the body is um, the ability of those two groups to get it to be unified in at peace is a demonstration of the gospel for Paul. And so these pastoral issues are gospel issues. They are the tangible reflection that God's reign is amongst us. And I think that's important for Highland to think about too, that the unity of the body, our ability to kind of work this out, is a visible sacrament and sign of God's reign amongst us. Because if, if, if the Christians are just fractious and divided and in conflict, and judging each other and verbally crucifying each other. One, that's not really good news. And two, how is that any different from like the world, right? The, the, what we see on social media, how are we any different as Christians from the world? So I think Tara, I think that's exactly right. Um, and David has uh, David Sessions has a little nuanced twist to the yielding of power you might wanna look at before you move on. Yeah, and so David writes uh, for us, everybody, David Sessions writes, for my own personal growth and discipleship, I wonder if a nuanced question might be, quote, in what ways recently have I been yielding my power, uh, unquote. Um, now, I think that's exactly right, David. I think that's what Paul's asking us to do. And that's kind of why I waded into the gender discernment stuff, not to put my thumb down on anything, but just ask, what does it look like wherever you stand at Highland? Um, what does it look like for you to yield? And if we all did that. Now, I think our worry is, isn't our deepest worry um, distrust? That if I yield, the other group won't yield. And that, that, I, that, that distrust of each other, that fear of each other, I think is one of the things that Paul is going after there. So, hey, Jana, you and I have a quote about power um, that we share a lot. You want to share that? Um, about David's question about ways of yielding power. That's a beautiful quote that Jan and I use a lot. Yeah, this has really become um, a, a defining point for us as we make decisions about things. And um, what we say is, who is flourishing because you have power? And, and at first the phrase kind of um, felt a little bit odd for me because just the word power itself to me um, often isn't nuanced, but it is a very nuanced concept. Uh, but power, who flourishes because you have power? Yeah. And so I, so I think that's what Paul's saying here. How, how can like the strong um, in, in Rome use their power so that their Jewish brothers and sisters can flourish in their community? So... Anyway, I have gone on a long ramble there, and you're probably thinking, when are we going to get to the text? So let me do some quick hits on the text, and then we will open it up for questions and um, comments. So I want to just kind of highlight what this looks like in Romans 12 through 16. These chapters are very topical, and so I'm just going to be dipping into various parts of, of, the, of these chapters to kind of illustrate what Paul uh, means about adopting a Christ-like posture. Scott McKnight calls it cruciformity, cruciformity, being formed in the image of Christ. So let's begin, if you have your Bibles, um, with Romans 12, uh, the very first verses there. 
So I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, uh, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. I want to just start there because it's obviously the beginning of this text, but it, it illustrates something pretty profound, which is, you know, when you think of sacrifices, at least in that Roman context, the Roman, you know, sacrifices are dead things, right? To, to sacrifice something is to kill an animal and offer it to a God to get some favor from that God or to appease that God. And Paul has this kind of interesting phrase that our sacrifice is to be living. And, and I think what Paul's saying, this goes back to Terry's comment earlier, is that the sacrifice we give to God isn't a dead thing, isn't a dead animal on an altar. The sacrifice that we give to God is the shared common life that we have together in Christ. This unity that we're pursuing in our divisions and in our diversity across the lines of power and privilege the yielding to each other that we've been talking about. This is the sacrifice, okay? That is, that is what we give to God, this living sacrifice. It is a living, breathing, um, and communal sacrifice. Um, as Paul goes on to say, right, well, what does that look like? What does this living sacrifice look like? And I'll just read a little bit here because I just think it's profound and beautiful. I can't top Paul, beginning in verse 9, chapter 12, verse 9. So what does the living sacrifice look like? Let love be genuine. Hate what is evil, hold fast to what is good. And so love one another with a mutual affection and outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal, right? Have some energy in your love. Have some a passion in your loving each other. Be ardent in spirit, right? Have the spirit involved and serve the Lord. So rejoice in hope. Be patient in suffering. Persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. So there's a material aspect here as well. This isn't just emotion. This is a material giving. Contribute to the needs of the saints and extend hospitality to strangers. Open up your home. Welcome people to table. So bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep, right? What happens with, when there's happiness in one part of the body, that's my happiness. When there is lamentation in one part of the body, there is lamentation in my life. Verse 16, live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Again, power and privilege. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Yield. Who flourishes because you have power? Um, do not claim to be wiser than what you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. And if possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. So far as it is possible, you'll you know, live peaceably with all. And so, you get a sense there that this is, this is what I'm trying to say, is the living sacrifice. A, a community characterized by this, the high going low, uh, loving, extending hospitality, outdoing each other in good works, loving each other, genuine love, passionate love, material love. This is, this is the living sacrifice. The other thing I want to draw attention to is jump to chapter uh, 15, if you, if you have your Bibles. Jump to chapter 15. This comes at the end, but, but it's, it struck me um, in, in a variety of conversations I've had this week about kind of the racial tensions um, that, have, that have, we've been dealing with the last couple of weeks. Um, and then the Carl Spain uh, event out at ACU last Sunday. Um, in chapter 15, Paul talks about this contribution. He talks about this in his other books, like in uh, Corinthians, where, I don't know if you know this about Paul, that one of the things he was doing is as he would go around to all these Gentile churches, that there was a famine back in Palestine. And one of the things Paul was doing was make, taking up a collection, gathering up funds to send those back um, to the church in Jerusalem to take care of the saints. 
And so if you read this in uh, Romans chapter uh, 15, uh, let me pick up in verse 25. At present, however, I am going to Jerusalem in ministry of the saints, for Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to share their resources with the poor among the saints at Jerusalem. They were pleased to do this, these Gentile churches. They were pleased to do this, and indeed they owe it to them. For if the Gentiles have come to share in their spiritual blessings, they ought to be of service to them in material things. That's an interesting comment that Paul makes here. These Gentile churches owe their Jewish brothers and sisters a debt of gratitude because it's through the Jews that the promises of Israel came to, right? It's through Israel that Jesus came. And so there is a spiritual legacy in debt that these Gentile churches have back to the Jewish church in Jerusalem. And so he says, hey, so they got this spiritual debt. Um, we ought to therefore be of service to them in material things. The reason why I'm highlighting the contribution in chapter 15 is that I don't think a lot of people talk a lot about that. Um, Paul's kind of international sensibility here. Um, but if you know Paul's letters, this was a big deal. This contribution that he talks about in all of his letters, that he asks his Gentile converts to, to participate in, to care for them, shows that Paul's imagination isn't just about that local unity of the body, but also the global, international, multi-ethnic unity of the body. Again, these churches are largely run by wealthy Gentiles in Rome, and he's asking them to look at the model here of contributing to the needs of the needy people back in Jerusalem. And the reason why I thought of this is when it comes to the issue of race relations, is a conversation I actually had with uh, David Sessions, sorry to put you on the hook again, um, but about, about how it is important for Christians to realize that the bodies of other Christians are my body as well. That's what Paul's doing here. He's saying, your body in Rome, your Gentile life in Rome is connected to the body across the world, the Christian body across the world. So the poor, per, the poor body, the poor Jewish body in Jerusalem has to be on your radar screen. What happens to them is happening to you. And what happens to you is happening to them. And, and that goes to kind of what um, Arlene Castleman talked about on Sunday night at the Carl Spain Center event was how there is in the African, South African community, this, this word uh, Mbutu. And Mbutu is this sense of interconnectivity, the interconnections amongst our, our bodies and how what happens to you happens to me. If you are diminished, I am diminished. And I think that's what Paul's doing with this contribution. I mean, it just, it seems like a random little note here in chapter 15, hey, I'm taking up this contribution. But I think the theological implications of that, of that contribution is Paul saying, hey, if there is something, it's the Mbutu between the Roman church and the church in Jerusalem. What happens in Jerusalem to your brothers and sisters there has implications for you, even far away in Rome. Okay, even if you don't speak their language, even if they're a different people group, we're all interconnected. And so again, this, this peaceable connection isn't just a local phenomenon, us working out our issues. It is a global phenomenon and how what happens to the bodies of anybody in the world affects our bodies um, as uh, well. So <clears throat> I wanna open this up for comments and questions here because we're at 9.34, but let me, let me end with one more thing. Um, that Paul's big theme here in these chapters is the idea of welcome. Um, he mentions it three different times. If you're taking notes, chapter 14, verse 1, he says, Welcome those who are weak in the faith, but not for the purpose of quarreling over opinions. So welcome those who are weak in the faith. Welcome those who are in that powerless position. Um, 
And then he mentions it again very quickly in verse 3 of Romans 14. Those who eat must not despise. Again, that's that verbal crucifixion of the other. Those who eat must not despise those who abstain. And those who abstain must not pass judgment on those who eat. So that's the verbal cru crucifixion going the other way, the judgment. But quote, but God, for God has welcomed them. And that leads to what we talked about last week is Romans 15, 7, which I suggested might be the theme of the entire book. So welcome. And so Romans 15, 7, it says, welcome each other as Christ welcomed you. And so that is his, that's how he's going to solve these divisions through this practice of welcome. And this welcome isn't just attitudinal. It's not just affectional. It's, it's, it's tangible welcoming people into our intimate spaces. The issue here is table fellowship. Welcome them, sit down together, break bread, be, be united. Welcome as Christ has welcomed you. And you'll notice there, that's the cruciformity piece. We welcome each other because Christ has a, extended a prior welcome to us. And as we look ahead to next week, that's, that's where the theology comes from. Paul is going to talk about, remember, we, we often think that the theme of Romans is chapters one, chapter one, verse 16 and 17, right? That the, that the gospel is the power of God for salvation for those who have faith, right? For the Jew first and then the Gentile. And you can kind of see where Paul's going. There has been an extension of welcome to the Jew first and then the Gentile. God has welcomed both groups now. Therefore, because we have all been welcomed to that table, the Jews are the natural branch, the Gentiles are grafted in, regardless, we're all been welcomed. And it's out of that prior welcome of Christ that we then welcome each other. And maybe that might be one of our biggest problems is a lack of gratitude for the way we've been welcomed. Because isn't that what happens when you have power and privilege? There's a sort of um, entitlement that we bring into the church. This is my church. Um, I want my way. Rather than moving through church and just being grateful that I'm there at all that I you know what I mean like if we operate out of gratitude might might we yield more easily is what I'm trying to say um it's not dissimilar to Jesus's parable of the unforgiving servant the unforgiving servant is forgiven this great debt of millions of dollars and then he goes out and he shakes down his his co-worker who owes him like 10 bucks and the tragedy of that story is that he the unforgiving servant isn't operating out of this sense of like, man, I've been forgiven so much. I, I'm operating out of such a great debt of grace that I can yield. You know, I, I, I can forgive that. I can yield that because I'm just a grateful participant in this family. And, and I think that might be an important location for all of us is that when we start getting anxious about the church, might we be operating out of a sense of maybe entitlement uh, and ownership rather than a sense of gratitude? We have a couple minutes now. So as I've been reflecting and just kind of hitting some highlights, I've missed some other things uh, that I wanted to talk about. Uh, raise your hand. Terry, I'm going to let you hop in. Terry, what do you have to say? Um, hi. I was just um, thinking about uh, the posture and the cruciform um, posture of, of when you go low, it's really, um, it's really, there's a, the purpose, one of them is to raise the other. And so as the other is raised, then they have the opportunity to give that gift to others. And so there's, it's a, it's not just a one-time thing, but it's this back and forth mutual 
edification or mutual submission or, or mutual love of empowerment. To, yeah. And I think it brings equality and um, touches on Paul's idea of siblingship in the family of God. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up, Terry. Uh, and, you, and we should let the people know that you've been studying with Scott. And, and have written some papers for him about all this. So this is kind of right in your wheelhouse right now. Yes, it? it is, it is. Yeah, so so definitely, so stay on the line. I just want your impression about that. So yeah, one of the things we didn't talk about, I skipped over it in chapter 12, is how when he starts talking about gifts and how we are one body with many members. So those of you that have your Bibles out, you know, chapter 12, verse four, for in one body we have many members, um, and we have all these different gifts. And so Paul has this economy of giftedness. I like that image that you said. The whole point here isn't a static one-time giving, but it is rather a fluid dynamic of sharing, giving, giftedness, flowing. So there's an economy of gifts in the kingdom. Um, and also, the, go ahead and talk a little bit more about the, the siblingship. Scott writes a lot about that. Like, what, what do you think Paul's doing with sibling language? Well, I think one is he's he's trying to focus that we have, we are under like one father. And the idea of siblings, he also uses grafted, where we're grafted into the family as siblings. And as siblings, you are, you, you know, um, it's a sibling, you know the gift and the weakness and the strength of the other because it's a different relationship. So Paul was really trying to, show that Christ ushered in a new kind of family. Um, and I'm still working on this because it's part of my thesis. And so, um, but I love that uh, Paul, most of the time when he addresses the church, it's, it's sometimes brothers and it's sometimes to an individual, but most of the time he uses a Greek word, which I don't know, but it translates as siblingship. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so I, I just love that. Yeah. And I, I think that's one of the, when I, when I talk to churches um, to come back to the issue of the gender discernment thing, and, I, and I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm only using that just because it seems to be a relevant example right now in the life of the church, is that, um, is that it seems like we achieve, un, and I think maybe this is our Church of Christ heritage, that we're, we try to achieve unity through agreement. Mm -hmm. uh, my mother-in-law, who may be listening in, Kathleen, I'm going to hearken at you. She came up to me one day and she goes, I think one of the, the toxic things that's happening when we try to make these discernments is that, we tr is that we tr we're trying always to get things right. We want to be right. And so unity will achieve by being right. And what it, you know, so hopefully Highland will do the right thing. But, but I think, Terry, what you're suggesting is Paul, that's not what Paul's trying to do. He's not trying to get the church to be right. He's trying to get the church to be siblings, mm -hmm. uh, to be family. And unity is achieved through that, not doctrinal correctness, but rather a, the, the, the family relationship that is supposed to emerge is, is, is the way the church is achieves unity. But that's tough for us, I think. Don't you think? Did you grow up in Church of Christ, Terry? No, I didn't. Uh, well, it's a, that's, a, that's a struggle for us because we have... Our, our kind of DNA has always been prop, you know, pr proper church structure, proper worship, you know, and I think this is common across a lot of denominations, that being correct is the way, you know, will be the Lord's true church. Right. And, and, then you right. Encounter, and then you encounter Paul, a very different way of going about that. He's like, y'all can have very different opinions on this thing. You got to welcome each other as brothers and sisters in Christ. Right. And I think the trap is with, when you're trying to be correct and right, your focus then becomes conformity and unity by conformity. Whereas he, we, Romans and even our world is very diverse. And so it's not unity by conformity, but unity of um, the spirit, unity of this self-giving love and cruciformity or Christiformity. Um, and so it's just, I think it's something that we need to be mindful of in, in any denomination. Oh, yeah. No, no, there's no doubt about that. Yeah. 
Um, hey, thanks, Terry. I'm going to see anybody else got a hand they want to raise um, or comment they want to make as we wrap this up. Um, thanks to everybody that shared and talked. We're at, we're at our time at 945. So let me just give you a, a preview of what's going to happen starting next week. So we, we, st we started at the back end of the book. Uh, 12 through 16, just looked at a couple different things. Uh, we're now going to start reading Romans backwards. So now we're going to do deal with the enigmatic, am I pronouncing that right? Enigmatic, the mysterious chapters 9, 10, and 11. What Paul's discourse about what's going to happen to Israel and God's promises to Israel. We're going to do that next week. And so come back next week and um, we'll see you then. Um, take a take a break. Church is going to start here in about 14 minutes. And so thank you guys for showing up. I'm honored that you're here. Thank you for everybody that raised their hands and commented. Um, and we'll see you next week as we talk about Romans 9, 10, and 11. You guys have a good week.